Welcome to Fort Knox. I am John Fort here this time with Christine Yen, the CEO and founder of Honeycomb. Christine, thanks for being with me. Um, I, I like to dive right in with the question, what is today's toughest problem that you're solving? And, and I see a lot of action in this DevOps market right now. I'm going to talk to HashiCorp later today. They, you know, consumption kind of slowing down a bit, but the MongoDB, you know, times are still pretty good over there. What are you seeing as you work in this market with developers trying to make uh, their jobs easier and clearer? Well, uh, first, Honeycomb uh, is in the business of helping developers understand why their software is going wrong uh, when it does, right? Software inherently, sometimes it does what we expect, sometimes it doesn't. Um, we help folks understand that difference. The, the toughest problem um, is frankly not a new problem for us. It's that this problem that I'm describing is inherently a socio-technical one. There's a technical solution that Honeycomb can provide, but with any tooling, it's only as useful as the way it is incorporated into human processes and yet that engineering culture. And so the toughest problem for us has always been, okay, how do we work with a customer to help them drive change inside their organization, to rally the humans around this new tool or new process and get better at understanding why software is misbehaving? Um, it's almost so cliche that to say the toughest problem comes down to the humans, but... No, I mean, no, it's, it's often us. It's often us. Is part of it in... Um, kind of the who done it aspect of it. Like if something's not working, some people might feel like, well, it's not my fault that it's not working. Who who should have made it work in the first? And, and I guess maybe that's less important than fixing it and fixing the process that created the issue. But how much of it has to do with whose fault is it that it didn't work right to begin with or what's wrong with our process that resulted in it not working right to begin with? I think um, that's a piece of it. But that's not, um, not always the core. Really, it's that humans are creatures of habit, right? And so with anything, you, you are used to a certain way of using data to answer questions like, why is my code not doing what I expect? And it's this age-old question of how do we help folks recognize the way they've always done things might not be the best way to do things going forward. Sometimes the whodunit comes into play. Um, honestly, I think it is less who in terms of humans and more where done it, if that makes sense. A little bit of figuring out um, you know, why a system is misbehaving is figuring out where the problem is. And um, as the software systems we build are becoming more complex, uh, it gets harder and harder to figure out where the problem is. And then maybe track it back to the, the humans involved. Speaking of where, how much has the change in the locations that teams work from affected mm -hmm. their ability to collaborate, understand each other, build trust, and then, and then solve these problems? I think it has affected it a fair amount. Um, I, I think that engineering teams, like engineering work is often done well where you can get focus time and certainly being able to work remotely can contribute to getting that great focus time. But you're absolutely right to call out that collaboration, that uh, learning from each other as being necessary for making sense of an unknown. And the, the move to remote work has made it, has sort of shifted, well, I'll say shifted some of the opportunity to tools like Honeycomb to reimagine how we can replicate that experience of, you know, a new engineer to a team leaning over the shoulder of an expert and saying, Hey, how did you figure that out? How did you, how did you, how did you figure out the where of that problem and, and how to, how, how can I fix it better next time? So, so are you saying that in essence, some hybrid and remote work has increased the need for a tool like yours to prompt the conversation that might have happened differently in the past? I think short answer is yes. Uh, tools can do a better job of acknowledging that they're, they are used by teams of people 
who are all different, who have all different levels of expertise with the tool, with the data, with the system. And um, it's a real opportunity for tools to be thoughtful and clever about how we surface those interactions. What about the way that you're leading at Honeycomb and the way your teams are working? How much of your work is in person versus remote? What has your growth trajectory been over this um, COVID and post-COVID period of time? Well, we actually always had aspirations of being a remote first company, even before COVID. Uh, I, I think right before COVID, we were maybe just about 25, 30 people, and two thirds of the company was Bay Area based in person with an office, one third was distributed. And we had a lot of practices that we'd already put in place to make sure that the experience was good for the folks who weren't based in our office. And so for us, as COVID happened, and now we are fully distributed, there is no return to office happening anytime soon. Um, I think that uh, we have just gotten better at many of those practices, while also, now that travel is beginning again, encouraging teams to get together to have opportunities for that in-person, trust-building, high collaboration time. So how big are you now, and, and what percentage in the Bay Area? Well, we're about 160 and 170 people now, and I think there are fewer than 30 people in the Bay Area. I might be off by a little bit, um, but it's been really amazing how quickly the company, uh, you know, how, how quickly the company's embraced working with people across different time zones. Um, you wouldn't believe the level of talent that we have access to no longer being limited to the Bay Area. Um, we actually looked at some of our stats um, earlier this year and found that something like two thirds or three quarters of our team are based outside even traditional tech hubs. So you take New York, Austin, Bay Area, um, you know, Denver out of out of the equation, and we've got folks in Tennessee, we've got folks in Quebec, we've got folks uh, in Utah. It's 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 a new world, uh, and it's very exciting. What do. does it take to connect those uh, employees, those team members, to the mission, um, not just intellectually? but emotionally, so that they feel like they're part of something that they don't want to leave. Because it, it already seemed like um, a lot of this uh, generation that we're in is more transactional with work, planning to move from one thing to another, maybe only be in this job for a couple of years. That seems a lot easier to do if you know, you're, you're not emotionally connected um, to, to the people you're working with. That's a good question. Um, I think for us, we have a little bit of a cheat code in that we are solving a problem that a lot of our people have experienced themselves. Um, almost all of our engineers have, well, I'll just say every one of our engineers, many of our product folks have had to wrestle with a situation in the past where their software was not doing what they thought it was. And they'd used other tools and you know, legacy tools were good when they, when they during their heyday and software system, systems have changed since then. Uh, beyond that cheat code though, I think that Honeycomb has really tried to be very clear and vocal, consistently vocal and broad in our vocalness of why what we do matters. We are not here just to build cool technology. We are here to, here to help our customers be the best software engineering teams that they can be. We are here to help build high-performing engineering teams to make on-call rotations not not be terrible. Um, we are here to reduce the toil of chasing down bugs and, and always being reactive. And I think that focus on the humans on the other side of that screen, on the other side of our product, continue to help our team, I hope, feel emotionally engaged in the work, even in this distributed environment. Okay. Well, now having learned uh, a bit about Honeycomb uh, and its mission and, and what you guys are working on the environment. I want to learn more about you. I like to start at the very beginning. So uh, tell me, where were you born? Tell me about your household, parents, any siblings? I was born in San Jose, California, so the heart of Silicon Valley. Um, my parents were both immigrants, and I have one older sister. 
And our household was very focused on how we could make ourselves better, how we could always be learning, always be uh, taking in new ideas, always pushing ourselves. And I think that that has really led to, you know, uh, I am I'm still looking for that today. Uh, I'm still reading a lot and always curious and always trying to learn something new. So I got to ask what part of San Jose, because I lived in San Jose <laughs> from late 1999 to 2013. Uh, so like, you know, South San Jose-ish, um, a lot of time downtown, then West San Jose. So let, let me visualize it. Where were you? I was uh, West San Jose. I lived in Saratoga. So just on that okay. Western border. Yeah, yeah. Um, that, that was near the, the spot where, where uh, I last was before heading out here about 10 years ago. So what were you into as a kid? Challenging yourself like in, in what kinds of areas? Not necessarily in school. I, like I said, I read a lot. Um, I think my, uh, really my origin story, especially the one that led me here is I remember in eighth grade, I broke up my ankle and I was very upset because this meant that I couldn't go on some graduation trip that, um, all of the other eighth graders could go on. I actually don't remember where it was. And I remember spending that day on my computer instead. And this is the early days of the internet where, GeoCities and Angel Fire were all the rage, right? These free web hosting services where anyone could could put something online. And I started exploring these web pages, what it meant to build a personal website, playing around with HTML and CSS. Uh, I really liked the the visual aspect of it as well, graphic design. Um, this now obviously extended beyond the one day um, where I missed the trip, but I loved the ability for me, just a you know girl in my house, to be able to put text into a text editor and turn it into something beautiful and visual that anyone on the internet could interact with. And there, at the time, there were these message boards where usually girls, but who knew? Um, kids were creating websites and, you know, uh, building new layouts and commenting on each other's guest books. And back then, there weren't a ton of resources on how to build websites. What you would do is you would go to someone's website and basically view the source Right, and you'd be like, "Oh, how did they? How did they get that text showing up over there? And how did they get that color doing this thing?" And you would go and you would learn and you would reverse engineer their their websites and you would borrow and, and turn it into your own. And I think that really planted the seed for the ability for such a low barrier to entry but high potential impact of the internet for me, um, and that became my deep very distracting hobby through <laughs> high school, college, beyond, um, just playing with web design, with web programming, eventually um, learning about databases and everything that backed the software that I used. Um, and it was really a time, you know, we talk a lot about walled gardens now and people talk about, you know, building, whether it is as easy and possible for kids to go and reverse engineer their world and, and really learn how something worked. Um, and I don't have, you know, there's always going to be new ways for kids to learn, but it was really magical for me. Uh, you sound like an artist in the way that you talked about that a little bit design first. And uh, I mean, I remember when I was learning a bit about HTML and CSS doing exactly that same thing. Mm -hmm. I'm not an engineer. I'm more of a creative We're, between music, design, arts, was there any of that that you were into? Um, I think the crushing crushing realization for me as I continued on this is that I was not enough of an artist. Uh, I wanted to be. I thought I could appreciate it. Uh, but uh, maybe I didn't have the patience to really build that skill. And instead, I just loved the learning 
and the impact that it could have. Um, in high school, a couple of friends and I, um, or I joined a couple of friends in building a website for our high school. And this was before Facebook. And I remember um, it started out as a, something where you could s compare schedules and you could see who was going to be in your classes before classes actually started, you know, in that two week period when you got your classes assigned. And then it which evolved high school is this? Sertica High. So SerticaHigh.com, which website doesn't exist anymore. Um, but we ended up getting a huge percentage of the human of the student body signed up and we had a calendar and some teachers would post homework. And I remember this conversation, this was in 2003, where we were like, and we added messaging and we were like, should we allow people to put up photos of themselves? And then we were like, no, 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 these are high school students. We can't trust them to put up photos of themselves. They'll just put up, you know, inappropriate things. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, we got something really wrong about how consumer internet would work for kids, but it but was- also um, right. But also right, yeah, that's true. And we wanted to be, you know, school appropriate. But it was magical, right? As something as simple as messaging and realizing that all you really needed was a database and a website and user accounts, and you could write something on this computer and have it show up in someone else's. It was just so exciting at that time. Um, and I look around now and I'm like, well, of course, everything needs messaging and everything is easy. All this is easy to build. But back then, we were I mean, just to throw some more jargon out there. We were FTPing files to a server and, you know, looking over again, the in-person aspect, right? We were, we were like, Hey, don't upload your change. I'm going to upload my change. And it's, it's, I am, I recognize I am lucky to have found something that really matters to me when I was young and able to pursue that in college and um, continue that as a career. Um, and I appreciate it every day. Just, you said your sister is older, right? Mm -hmm. So what part of the technology uh, wave that was sweeping through the culture and certainly through Silicon Valley uh, did she catch? I think, well, first, <laughs> she was cool in high school. So I think she had better things to do than hang out on the computer by, her, by herself. Um, I think she, she was always much more interested in business than the technology. Um, and so I think she is as much a digital native as folks you know, who, who grew up in the 90s were, but has for the most part been not as involved in, in tech itself. And what, what were your parents' attitudes toward the technology, the, the potential versus the distraction? My dad always just wanted to make sure I got enough sleep so he'd see me on the computer and he'd be like, mm, should you be sleeping more? Um, I think my mom didn't quite understand either why I was spending so much time on the computer. And I think for them, you know, again, this is uh, attitudes or parents not really understanding the dark corners of the internet um, or there not being as many dark corners of the internet back then. Um, but they were kind of like, well, computer seems fine. Christine seems like she's getting good enough grades at school. So, you know, we're not gonna, we're not gonna get too involved. And I think I appreciated that freedom. Because I then I could really, you know, do it and explore things because I wanted to not, not for some other goal, or some other pressure. So when did MIT come into the picture for you? MIT came into the picture, you know, in high school, like I said, I, I was already interested in software and I was already sort of always excited to learn. Um, and while the Bay Area is a great place to grow up, I desperately wanted to get exposed to something new, uh, especially why? as- I mean, college. Stanford's there, Berkeley's there. Why, why go anywhere? The logo that we used for saratagahigh.com was a bubble that's how it felt, right? Everything was idyllic. Um, the weather is perfect. Um, and I knew the world was bigger than that. So I wanted to experience something. I wanted to go to the East Coast. I wanted to go to a big city. Um, and MIT really checked all those boxes. And it was 
a place where I could let my nerd flag fly uh, in a really different environment than I had grown up in. Um, what was most different about it besides the weather? You, you went to a great spot for <laughs> much worse weather. Um, so that expanded your horizons there. But That's true. Lots of nerd flags at MIT and, you know, in Boston area in general. So I don't know if your, your flag could be distinguished that easily <laughs> from others. But that's uh, true. What, what else what else was was shocking or, or gratifying about that? Uh, this is going to sound very silly uh, for something that was shocking. I had never really been exposed to people who cared about how I how I dressed. And. And this is not necessarily East Coast people, but this is just, you know, lots of other people, uh, people outside the Bay Area, um, you know, would, <laughs> I had a, I had a t-shirt in college that I thought was hilarious. Um, it was a dinosaur, big dinosaur with um, a pile of poop behind the dinosaur and underneath the pile of poop, you could see, you know, legs and a, a, basically a person that had been crushed. And then another person who uh, was upset. And this is the time of, again, threadless.com, lots of crowdsourced uh, clothes. And I thought it was hilarious. And I just remember some people being like, Christine, like you're wearing your poop shirt. And it had never really been a thing, you know, t-shirts, especially in Silicon Valley, were a way to be humorous and irreverent and uh, maybe express an interest and hadn't really thought before what fashion meant to other populations of folks. So, I mean, there are a couple of different ways to take that. One is, you're welcome. Isn't it hilarious? <laughs> Another is, hmm, what, what impression do I want to be making with these people in their J. Crew? you know, or whatever it was that they were wearing in Boston at the time. Uh, yeah, exactly. I think it was a mix of reactions. And, you know, I, I still, me being really stubborn and uh, still wore that shirt a couple times after people made comments, but it, it made me more conscious. And some could definitely say that's a terrible thing. You know, let, let, let the college kid wear her poop shirt. But... I, I think that's part of growing up and being exposed to those different perspectives that I wanted in going to college on the East Coast. And not, not what I expected, not what most people would probably say coming out of MIT, but it was, it was an exposure to the East Coast and I liked it. When did you get entrepreneurial? Because it seems like um, mm -hmm. it didn't take long after MIT before you were co-founding something. I would never have expected that for myself, to be honest. Um, when I was in college, I was uh, felt like one of the few people interested in the startup scene. I liked that uh, there were all these new companies building something out of nothing, and it was exciting for me to pay attention to what new products were being built. But I honestly had would never have thought of myself as an entrepreneur. And part of I think part of the yeah, an origin story. It was graduating in 2009 into the recession. All around me, friends were getting their job offers rescinded, start dates pushed back. And thankfully, I had a, um, a job to go to. But I think it imbued in me this sense of there's always a Things can get bad and we will be, we will, we can tough it out, but there is always a way to claw your way up, to find an opportunity, to take advantage of the opportunity. And so in end of, end of 2010, it was, um, the, the startup I had, uh, started a job at was acquired by face, uh, acquired by Google. I found myself really unhappy at Google. Um, I think Google's because? a great company. It's a great company for folks who want something big and stable. But I was young. I was ambitious. I wanted to learn. Again, I had coworkers tell me not to leave because Google would teach me to be a great junior engineer. 
And I looked at them and I said, I want to be a great engineer. I don't want to be a great junior engineer. If that's all I can get here, <laughs> of course I'm going to leave. So, and you're talking about a Google of, you know, 2010, 10, 15 years ago, that was frankly a lot smaller <laughs> than Google of today. You know, I, I keep trying to underline, like, I think Google is a great company for a lot of people. It wasn't for me. And I have just come to accept this about myself, that I am a small company person. I love environments where there's so much more to do than people to do it. And I don't have to fight for responsibility. I don't have to fight for opportunity. In a startup, the, you know, the, the boat is still being built. There are leaks everywhere and everyone needs to take part in bailing that water. And so that's what has always driven me and attracted me towards the startup world. And at the end of 2020, uh, end of 2010, eventually I was like, well, you know, what do I have to lose? I have a little bit of a nest egg, um, enough to survive very cheaply as a new grad. Um, and let's try to build something new. And my co-founder and I didn't really know what we were doing at the time. And uh, I will say the company, I left that company a year later. It never really went anywhere. I what was it them. supposed to do? It was supposed to be a marketplace for venues for event planners. And looking back at that time, I knew nothing about professional event planning. I knew nothing about being the owner of a venue uh, or a small business owner. And, you know, thought that the market for corporate events and my having been a member of the tech, you know, workforce gave me enough experience to have an opinion on this space. Since then, I have learned to start companies in areas that I know deeply or well enough to have a, an informed opinion. But back then it was sort of, here's a, here's a problem. Let me try to rub some technology and solve it. Uh, and I rub some technology on the problem to solve it. And I learned a lot about how the business world doesn't always work the way that technologists think it should. And sometimes there are good reasons for that. So what was the process for identifying the problem that, that you were going to solve and for getting together with your co-founder in that case? I'd like to say that there was a process. I think my co-founder and I got along as friends and had both heard about how finding a, a venue was the most painful part of planning any event. And so decided to charge after that problem and try again we tried to learn as much as we could about event the how event planners went about it and how small business owners managed events in their spaces and uh, it could not learn enough in the time that we need we were willing to devote to it to really do that space justice and i think on the side of it i really just am learning that i don't think it was uh, I don't think it was a problem that could be solved just with technology. It comes down to the people, mm -hmm. comes down to those business relationships and required a deeper understanding of how that business really worked. And so instead you did what? Instead, I found some friends who needed an iOS app built. I wanted to learn how to work with iOS and decided to, you know, take a breath contract for a while, learn something new, and sort of reset. Uh, how much of a leap was that into iOS? Uh, the, the iPhone is still relatively new, 2007 or so. It's coming out. At first, the App Store isn't a thing, but by 2008, 2009, it's becoming more of a force. Right around the time um, when you're when you're getting out of this startup and, and I guess Uber and things like that are starting to show the smartphone specific potential of, of apps and connectivity. Um, how were you learning and what intrigued you about that platform? I think what intrigued me about that platform was it was, again, this is the era of there's an app for that. And I want to be a part of that. Right. Um, again, it felt like a new way of 
building something out of nothing and ha having a, <laughs> uh, the, the idea of being able to work with designers and me not having to be that artist and have someone be able to provide uh, the, the, the creative and, and art assets to make a beautiful experience was really appealing. Um, it was also clear that mobile was here to stay and I wanted to add a new skill set to my toolbox. I wanted to understand the challenges of mobile app development and the way I went about learning it. I think Stanford at the time had a great online free course where you could just work through their lectures. I did that. I read blog posts, tried things. I lived in San Francisco at the time, so I would go to meetups and talk to folks when I got stuck. And again, it was fun to just learn. I had a goal, I had to ship this thing for my friends, but really I just got to immerse myself in a new technology world. And then you went to work for another company that got acquired by a bigger company. I, I did, I did. did. This time you didn't leave immediately. This time I didn't leave immediately. And, and really that iOS experience is what led me to that, that other company. Um, that other company was focused on the challenge of how to help app developers focus just on what made their app special rather than trying to reinvent the wheel of saving data and pulling data back out. And that all was something I had been able to experience firsthand when I was contracting with these friends. And I think that startup that I joined, it had built a product that users loved, that developers loved. And the team there didn't tell me things like, Christine, you'll learn to be a great junior engineer. They, I think we were all hungry to learn and build and do great things. And when that acquisition happened, uh, I mean, and this actually bleeds into the, honey, the honeycomb origin story. One of the challenging things about building this system that allowed app developers to not have to worry about all the complicated things that happen on the servers um, meant that we as an engineering team had to take on that complexity. We had to make sure everything just worked. And the challenge of figuring that, that out with so many different app, mobile apps using us meant that the tools that we were using to figure out why our software was misbehaving didn't quite keep up. Like the incumbents that we used at the time were not built for our particular level of complexity, our particular level of sort of real needing to resolve things in real time. And inside Facebook, we were exposed to a tool that was built for that complexity in that real time. And my co-founder and I, who, whom I met at the, that startup, sort of looked at each other and we were like, oh man, this is, this is breaking all of my assumptions of what tools in this space can do. And I don't wanna build a system like that anymore, or again, without a tool like this that helps us make sense of what's happening for this one app among hundreds of thousands, why is it happening like that for them? And then who else is impacted? And I think one of the, the really fun things about having that experience with my co-founder there, she and I are very different people. Um, I was more of a product engineer, right? Building websites. She was much more an ops and infrastructure per person, operations meaning she was really thinking about making sure there was no downtime, making sure that the machines that we were running the code on were uh, scaling well enough. And today, when I think about who Honeycomb is building for, who comprises that software engineering team trying to figure out why your code is misbehaving, it's for the spectrum of people between our two poles. And I don't think we would have deeply understood this problem we're solving today and the people we're solving it for had we not stuck it out a little bit longer at Facebook and really used that tool and seen how it impacted the engineering teams around us. 
how did Facebook resource wise, capital wise, provide you the capability to start Honeycomb? Um, and maybe that is just stock. <laughs> maybe that's connections, particularly to um, to investors, to angel investors, to you know VCs. Um, maybe that's also just that sort of uh, cachet that comes with being ex Google and Facebook. It's really the last piece um, and some connections. Uh, my co-founder and I did not look like typical tech founders when we started the company. We both had color. That shirt. Sorry. Because you were still was, wearing that shirt. I had uh, given that shirt away many years ago, but still the person Actually, that would wear that shirt. If you had worn that shirt, you might've looked more like, but still that, some key that's differences. That's maybe true. Yeah. That's maybe true. Um, but you know, we both had colored hair, tattoos. Um, we were women. And I think that when we started the company and we're raising money, especially the thing that helped people take us seriously is people who didn't know us personally is, oh, they're coming out of Facebook. Oh, they must know something. And I certainly chafe a little bit that at the idea that that was the credibility we needed for people to take us seriously. That is not the way the world should work, um, but was the way the world did, I think. And since then, I hope that we have proven ourselves such that we no longer need exclusively that Facebook cachet. But it but, was. But, and let's have a real part of this conversation here. We haven't been There's real yet. A real part of this, a real part of this conversation. Fair. There's that gap between when people see you and people see your resume, right? Like how people treat you when they, when you walk in the room and how people treat you after you're introduced as, oh no, this is the engineer I was telling you about who, who just came out of Facebook, Right. How much of that did you run into? I mean, I can't actually say credibly because I've never not been me. So I can't, I, I can't really speculate as to what it would have been like had we looked the part. Um, what I can say is that I think there are a lot of things about our upbringings that lead us to show up a certain way in a room, right? No one, no one looks at me and go, you know, no one would pick me out in a crowd and say, yes, she's a CEO of a growth stage venture backed company that is killing it. Um, no one would pick me out of a crowd when I was in high school and say, oh, she's going to do great things. And thinking back to those sort of internal expectations that I was instilled by my parents, uh, that the difference between those internal expectations and those external expectations uh, has really placed a giant chip on my shoulder to prove everyone wrong. And true of my co-founder as well, very different background, same chip. And so again, we can't speak to how differently our lives would have gone if we were different people or looked different, but Boy, we are uh, someone. Uh, someone recently described us when our at our when the news broke of our most recent round that we raised. Uh, described us as people founders who would run through walls to make observability happen. That's the name of our category, and that an element of that feels really right. It is. We are the two most stubborn lumps of rock you will find in technology. We are fighters. And so there's, there's pros and cons to people not looking at us and seeing what they expect of two technical founders of a growth stage company. Tell me about your co-founder. What are those um, similarities and differences? She, you can tell, I try to be, I try to be careful about what I say. My, my parents being immigrants, um, were more sparing in their words. My co-founder, Charity Majors, likes to provoke. 
I think she's very good at saying things that get people thinking and that challenge the way that people view the world, the work. Um, I like rules. I'm just used to rules. I want to follow the rules. I'm an engineer. You know, I want to build within the rules. She likes breaking rules. I think that, um, you know, I wear lots of black, neutral colors. She wears all the colors of the rainbow. Uh, today still has purple, purple and blue hair. Um, likes coloring outside the lines. I mentioned I am very developer. She's very ops person. And I think that the differences between us and the work that we do to understand each other and still work together are what allow us to be really thoughtful about the teams that we build, to be really thoughtful about how the honeycomb message will land with different populations of folks, it allows us to be more creative in how we put forth the company message and talk about our product and talk about the value. And it is it's an incredible dynamic and I'm deeply grateful to have her in my life. So there's a question I like to ask about what I call death value, lowest point, because <laughs> I think there's a lot to learn from how one gets through that and what one gets from that. So in this journey uh, of Honeycomb, what would you, what would you say that was? There was a point, maybe about a little over three years in, where we had built a product, but it had taken longer than it should have because we weren't taking pieces off the shelf and putting them together. We were being being a, effectively a data tool, we were rebuilding these big key components of our data architecture that just didn't exist in the way that we needed for us to provide the experience we wanted to our users. And so we, we took the time and we built it right and we built it for the experience that you know made us scratch our heads and say, oh, this is different than the incumbents that I'm used to. But from an external investor perspective, it just looked like Honeycomb were tinkering around on the technology and didn't have enough customers, didn't have enough revenue for the you know length of time we as a company had been alive. And it was in this backdrop that we had to go raise. Uh, we had been fairly conservative and with our, our spend thus far, you know, not none of these like monster rounds that we're hearing about today, but so roughly still, what year is it? This was 2019. Um, but still, you know, building technology costs money. Hiring engineers costs money. And so we were we had to go out and figure out how to tell the Honeycomb story in a way that investors would understand why we were breaking into a space that folks thought were solved. Lots of investors in our early years told us the best products in this space have already been built no one needs you. We knew that they were wrong, but we didn't have the worth of the time to really tell them why. And we, we needed to find someone who could help see through our not having the words and understand what we were trying to build and, and the change that we were really trying to drive. Why observability as a word needed to exist instead of the, 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 the logging or monitoring words that had been previously used. And it was rough because Charity and I never for a minute lost faith that the world needed Honeycomb. We knew, we had seen this tool inside Facebook. Remember, this is an internal tool that transformed how we built software, how many teams inside Facebook built software. So we knew there was something new to bring to the world. But the worst part was this feeling of we are not wrong. We are just doing it wrong or we're just executing wrong. Or, you know, maybe we aren't the right ones to make this change happen. And those are the worst moments as a founder, right? Where 
you are, you know that there's a need and an opportunity in a startup. There's no one else to blame. It's, it's just you and the folks in your boat. And some of this is your environment too, because 2019 um, is top line, top line, top line, <laughs> growth, 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 throw people, throw resources at the problem and mediocre solutions shipped quickly that get better over time, you know, minimum viable product stuff. It, it's very, that's very much going on. So uh, within that environment, um, I imagine not only are some potential customers or investors willing to deal with a certain level of sloppiness in the code, but they're also expecting, well, I'm not going to talk to anybody who's not growing at this rate, right? Is, is that part of, and now the environment is very different. <laughs> yeah. Well, now Honeycomb seems very smart for not having overspent in those early years. And again, Charity and I had both been in Silicon Valley long enough. We been through enough startups, booms and busts. We knew overspending is the way to death. That none of the technology matters unless you can figure out how to sell it. Again, in 2019, we had some customers, just not enough. Um, and so we had always been relatively exceptionally frugal, thoughtful about wh what we invested in and how and when, including the boom times of 2020 and 21, uh, we had a pressure externally, hire more, grow more, you know, throw more money at the problem and improve that top line at, the, at that, the peak of that market. And, you know, I really credit our VP engineering at the time who drew the line and said, we can't onboard more people. We can grow at this rate. This is the maximum number of people we can onboard and make successful into our engineering team. And I just will not hire beyond that. And I think it was hard to hear at the time, but we said, okay, fine, understood. And now looking back that, that VP, her name is Emily Nakashima, holding that line has really helped make sure that we have our, our growth trajectory over the last couple of years was a responsible one. Um, so many questions, <laughs> uh, but first, so how did you solve that funding problem? Uh, when yeah. the numbers didn't look like a lot of investors wanted them to look at that particular moment. The one investor who was willing to go out on a limb for us was someone who actually had a technical background and had lived that problem of trying to make sense of a very complex system with you know, small things impacting a subset of your of customers. Uh, I think that this... It was something that we just, like I said, didn't have the words for at the time. And he was able to connect those dots and in those intervening years, help us with our messaging. But Who this was, was something, uh, his name was Ariel Tetlin at Scale. And he had previously been the director of engineering at Netflix. And so he, he could, you know, I keep talking about, he could see through what we were trying to do and knew that there was something there. And all you need is one. So uh, I've also got to ask, there are a few companies that I've spoken to um, happen, a lot of them happen to be female founded and led that have been able to consistently recruit and retain uh, technical talent, happens to be women um, that, that make decisions that are crucial to the trajectory. What is it about the um, uh, culture of recruiting, of visibility, of representation, whatever it is, excellence, all those things that you think um, help build out your uh, executive team into what it is? And there's two things. One, like I said, charity likes to draw outside the lines. And we were very vocal early on about which lines we felt needed to be drawn outside especially in a typical tech recruiting process. So being showing 
potential hi hiring pool, recruiting pool, that we thought some things were broken and some things worked, but other things were, you know, we, we, we want to play with. I think first is a good sign that we didn't just want to model ourselves purely after the big players of the day. And the second thing is acknowledging that great technologists, whether they're women, black, any other underrepresented minority in tech, really just want to be somewhere where they can be great technologists. And that the focus is on what they do and what they bring to that organization, what they can, what actions they can drive instead of demographic factors that are out of their control. So if I can read between the lines here and the first part is part of what you're saying that you weren't looking for heads of engineering who had just been at Google and Facebook. That is true. Actually, our, that VP of engineering is someone we hired in as an individual contributor in 2017. So we grew her. Um, and I don't know if it would have crossed our mind to look for engineering leadership from a traditional company because we were a startup and the scales are so different. The, pro the sizes of the problems and the types of problems that you solve are so different. And um, we wanted to find folks who would, like us, want to challenge the status quo of how tech hiring, technology building was happening. Um, so often whatever gets you through that Death Valley experience becomes a core belief, a tool in the toolbox that you continue to use as a leader, as a manager. What was the lesson from that experience, whether whether it was the value of listening to a team member, whether it was, I, I don't know, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but um, what was the what was the core belief that you got out of that that you continue to draw on? Retain conviction in the core problem we were solving, but be willing to experiment with everything else. Messaging how the sale happened, how we structured a sales process, what types of customer, what that what that interaction with customer looked like. Um, there were a lot of things that we needed to figure out and needed to bring the full sort of brunt of our creative energy that we had previously poured into the technology into the go to market. And when you're trying to do something new, anytime you're trying to do something new, um, there are best practices that are worth knowing so that you can know the rules, but then also know how to break them and know how to experiment beyond that. So Sounds like you got, has carried you got a founder for each. You know. <laughs> We've rubbed up a, a bit on each other along the way. So it's good. So um, tell me about the strategic imperatives then for the rest of 2023, um, given the economy that we're in, especially we haven't talked about AI, but um, and how that affects observability. But there's a lot of potential for AI to result in mass produced mediocrity, especially when it comes to mm -hmm. code and and people not knowing or expecting what it's going to do when it actually runs. Right. That's absolutely true. I think AI is, it sounds like a cliche at this point, but one of the most exciting things to be happening to the technology industry. Um, I certainly, the, the scenario you're describing is something we're considering. I also think that in terms of going back to building that experience of being able to look over the, someone's shoulder, being able to tap into an expert on your team, translating human intent into a, the interface of a technology product, AI can do things on that front that just help teams be better at using tools. And I think that is incredibly exciting for us because that's what we, you know, we're here to make engineering teams be more awesome, not just build cool technology. Uh, the technology helps with that. Um, other thing, strategic things, like I said, changing behavior is hard especially in an environment like this where folks are maybe have less, less energy for new things and are very concerned about cost and very concerned about, um, you know, the, the doing more with less. And so these are all things that we're really thinking about how to 
stay true to our core, the core value and the core problem that we're solving, but being experimental and creative in how we bring folks along a journey they're going to eventually have to make, whether now or later. All right. Christine, I appreciate you uh, taking the time to lay out the story of Honeycomb and your own story for me here on Fort Knox. Thanks so much for having me.